get a group up at front like we have again now. It's just great celebrating birthdays. First half of the month, first half of the quarter, brand new series, Living in Hope. That's us. That's our, uh, what we are as a Seventh-day Adventist church. We are people of the hope, the hope of Jesus Christ's soon return. And um, so we're going to do a whole uh, quarter on living as people of hope. What does it mean? How does it mean to actually live in hope? And uh, next week, uh, our preacher's going to lead us in um, a good old-fashioned sermon on the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's the, uh, the hope of Seventh-day Adventist uh, Christians all down through the history of our church. And I know that um, my grandma used to look out the window of her bedroom every day longingly hoping that Jesus would come back. The blessed hope was just so in, ingrained in her heart that uh, she lived it, teached it, longed for it and would say to us kids, I hope Jesus comes soon. I wish I could look out there and just see him coming. Well, she's passed away, but she's died in the blessed hope and I can't wait to see her on that uh, day when Jesus comes back and say, the hope has been realised, the hope is here. And so um, today I'm going to do an overview to set the scene for the quarter, definitions of hope, what hope is, and hopefully pull that together a little bit for us. And then um, we've got our, our preachers during the next quarter, this quarter we'll preach on um, living in hope. Today, I want to look at the promise of hope. And I want to look at the promise of hope in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. I don't know about you, but as I'm reading the Bible through in a year, as a fair few of us are doing it, I'm just loving the Old Testament stories that are coming out. And I can't help but when I'm reading and studying and preaching in the New Testament, going back to the foundations that I find of where the truths are coming from in the Old Testament. And um, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah um, is an interesting um, character. And we're going to look at him today. Uh, if you could turn to Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, uh, book, yeah, chapter 1. In our world, we don't have to travel um, too far to see absolute hopelessness. Most um, times when I'm down at middle of meals, I sit on the gutter there, I stand beside people, go over to their cars and talk to people who they just want to have hope. They've lost their hope. They just want that back. Last night, last night I was sitting in a, in a chair beside a couple and um, the, the pressures of the finance system and the, and the world economy has just got hold of them. And they heard that West Australia was a lucky state and uh, mining, etc. And they um, hopped in their car and drove across the Nullarbor. And that's all they've got. They've left everything else behind. And um, they're camping currently up on the uh, Northern Highway and just living out of their car. And um, as I talked to, to Dan, he said to me, we had hoped, we had hoped that we would find this, we'd hoped to find that, we hoped to find a rental, we'd hope, hope, hope. And as we walk out into the streets, our neighbourhoods, we find this story is happening more and more. And we need to be people of hope that can give hope to the hopeless. It is um, tough to live or make it through a day without hope. Hope, what is it? My definition I want to work with today and through this uh, quarter of our series is this. So if you want to work out where I'm coming from, this is what hope is. Hope is a vision for better days that changes us in the present. Hope is a vision for better days that changes us in the present. Jeremiah was a real person. Around 627 BC, he was a boy. And uh, as a young boy, God came to him and said these words in Jeremiah 1 verse 4. Jeremiah 1 verse 4.
Jeremiah 1 and verse 4. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, as a young boy, knew that he had a calling on his life. Jeremiah, as a young boy, knew that he had been set apart by God himself. And Jeremiah, as a prophet to the nations, was to give hope in hopeless causes. Fast forward 40 years, and Jeremiah is a spiritual leader for his community. In 587 BC, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, and he um, had the people so under the thumb with his armies marched around the city and blocked off all their water supply and their food supply that they were on the brink of starvation now. And things were getting desperate in the city. And um, we find Zedekiah, um, he uh, thinks he can fight back and win. But um, he is absolutely struggling. 2 Kings 25 verses 2. 2 Kings 25 verses 2. I'll start at verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, he's the king of uh, Israel at this time, in the tenth day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem with his entire army. They laid siege to the city, built a siege wall around it, and the city was under siege until Zedekiah's eleventh year. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that the common people had no food. Then the city was broken into and all the warriors fled at night by way of the city gate between the two walls near the king's garden. Even though the Chaldeans surrounded the city, as the king made his way along the route to Araba, the Chaldean army pursued him, overtook him to the plains of Jericho. Zedekiah's entire army left him scattered. The Chaldeans seized the king, brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered Zedekiah's sons before their eyes. Finally, the king of Babylon blinded Zedekiah, bound him in bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. That's the reality of what's happening. That's the situation that um, uh, Jeremiah finds himself in the current climate, the political climate, and um, the desperation of the people that are around him. Zedekiah, uh, you know, to, the, to his last days, was having a false impression of what was going on. And he had some um, spiritual leaders that were advising him, and um, they were advising him very, very wrong. And they had painted um, Jeremiah in a very bad light. They said to the king, Jeremiah is a madman and he's a fraud. Don't listen to a thing he's preaching. Don't listen to a thing he is saying. And um, they, they just told the king what the king wanted to hear. And uh, we notice that a lot in today's climate too, don't we? Well, as a result, Jeremiah is thrown into jail because he's seen as a national security threat. Here he is in jail in the midst of this grim historical circumstance. He's misunderstood. He's labelled, derided. And uh, in this situation, he brings out one of the most powerful statements that many of the following prophets, many of the following Bible writers would draw upon in their powerful sermons, in their powerful passages, in their powerful writings. In this desperate situation that his, his people are finding themselves in, 
In his hopeless situation that he now finds himself in in this prison cell, he writes these words, Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. Look, the days are, are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. Now, in most other Bible translations, it says, look, better days are coming when I will fulfil the good promise that I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And in those days, as it, at the time, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up for David, and he will administer justice, righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell secretly, securely, and this is what she will be named. The Lord is our righteousness. This is a wonderful passage, a passage that gave Jeremiah's people hope, a passage that's given Christians hope all down through the centuries. The hope in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming. And we notice there, it says there, when I will fulfil the good promise that I have spoken. The day of the Lord is a promise. And uh, my first point this morning in my sermon is that hope is about a promise. Hope is never based on wishy-washy thinking and feelings or how much faith we have. All too often, our religion and our spirituality is based on myth and feelings. Hope is based on the God who is really there. And that's what um, Jeremiah is saying to the people. Don't trust in what stories are getting around about me or about God. He is real. He promised. And his day is coming. Hope, even today, church, is based on what Jeremiah is experiencing. Hope is based on a history with God that gives glimpses of his character and provides a reason why we should trust in a God and place our hope in God. That is why it is imperative that we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians in the last days, place our hope here. Read this here, how we're reading this year, and I notice some of you are saying, we're being inspired, we're, our eyes are being opened like never before, because you're reading about a God and you're finding his character, you're finding hope in his life and strength in his heart to live your day-to-day -day work because the Bible has power and that's why it has lasted so long and that's why it is still the number one book because the Bible has the ability to change lives. I see that I wish you could be with me in my Bible studies with people. It's never Lauren Pratt that changes the people's lives. As I open the word, sometimes with people who are out and think, oh, how on earth is this person going to um, come through? I've had Bible studies... I ran a Revelation seminar once in Innisfail. I had one person attend, and he was a Freemason. We baptised him. Because um, the power in the Bible, I might wonder how on earth it's going to happen. Is it hopeless? It's never hopeless when you open God's word and have the ability, because God's word changes lives. At college, um, we were told in our third year that we had to go and get a Bible study. And so we um, went out letterboxing. And, um, well, I'm rather happy. Finally, after a while, one of my cards comes back in. And um, I go knock on the door, and it's a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I felt the pressure of class pressure. There was people there who could study the Bible more than me preach better than me, and they are graduating in flying colours. Got to go on, at least I'll get my numbers. And so when I've had a report, I reported, yeah, three Bible studies. Yeah, four Bible studies in, and how we're having with this guy, Paul Purse. I studied with him all the way through for two years. And then um, I left and um, got my appointment over here. One day, 
I get a phone call and it's Paul. Would you like to come back to the Central Coast? I'm being baptised in Central Coast Church as a seven-day Adventist. This has power to change lives. And all too often we leave it on the shelf, we leave it unread, we read other things and we don't read this. Because this has the power to change Lauren Pratt's life too. This has the power to change your life as well. And so this book tells us that there is a promise. A promise that started in Genesis 3.15 that God will put enmity between man and the woman. And it ends with a promise, I will come soon. And the promise that was given in the garden was looking forward to the promise that was given in the end of Revelation that says, I will come soon, I will come quickly. And all in between time, it shows how people lived and dealt with the promise. It's time that you and I, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, got back into God's word and studied his promise and realised that we are a part of the promise, (coughs) a part of the story, and make God's story our story and live that story in our lives so it becomes other stories as well. And that is the reason why we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians in the last days, we're simply sharing the story of the promise with those who need to hear the promise. Secondly, we find here in this passage, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up from David. My first point is hope is about a promise. My second point is hope is about a person. Hope is about a person. Hope is not wrapped up in time or a program. A new job, a better spouse, or a bigger house. That rhymes. It's wrapped up in a person, the righteous branch. David was Israel's greatest king. There was never anyone as good or like him, and they all loved him, both in David's time and looking back to him. We know that he had fatal flaws, but he was also a warrior for justice and truth, and that is what God calls his people to do and to be. Even today, he calls us to be... um, Warriors for justice and truth in a world that needs to see justice and truth. David was Israel's greatest king, but God promised that there was someone coming that was even greater than David. And all through the Bible story from here on in, people looked forward to the one that was greater, the one that was greater, and it was Jesus Christ, their Messiah, Lord and the righteous one. Righteousness, as it says here, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up for David. Righteous is a relational word. It's someone who lives totally right with God and others. That's what a righteous person is. Someone who lives totally right with God and others. Now, the Bible says, doesn't it, and you know very well, there is no one righteous. But this branch, this promised one, this Messiah, will be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness. Come down with me to um, verse 14. The Lord is our righteousness. In other words, he will get it right all the time. This leads us to the heart of the gospel. The New Testament declares that Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness, died on the cross. He took our unrighteousness and in a mutual exchange, he gives us his righteousness. And that's the outstanding good news that all of us need to hear. Or simply put this way. Are you ready for a one-liner? 
I said it two weeks ago. Here we go again. God loves you. We messed up. Jesus died for you. You choose. That's the gospel. God loves you. We messed up. Jesus died for you. You choose. Hope gives us a promise. Hope is found in a person, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, and no one else. Thirdly, hope changes us in the present. Hope changes us in the present. That's my third point for the day. It changes us in the present because we always have someone we can call on, the righteous one, our Lord. The power of God that we see given to the Bible people is available to you and I today through the righteous one, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are able to win life's battles if we hold the hand of the righteous one. Romans 8, 35 to 37, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans 8, 35 to 37. Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We always live in the love of the Lord. We always live with his hand watching over our lives and nothing can separate from us from that. Nothing. The power of God is available to us today. We are able to win life's battles that we are not expected to win because we have the Lord on our side, the Lord in our heart. We can gain confidence in the future regarding the impossibilities that are in front of us or the adversity or the giants that we're facing at the moment because we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. This gives us four things. Having Jesus on our side, or as David calls the, the righteous one, our Lord, the branch of David. Having Jesus on our side in the present day now, we have the promise, we have the prom hope of, in the person, Jesus Christ, but we have a change now present because we have a change of focus. We stop focusing on ourselves, we stop focusing on others, and we focus on our Lord and Saviour only. And we focus on our Lord and Saviour only, all the things of this world that we preached last week grow strangely dim. Our job is to keep our eyes on the eyes of the Saviour and nowhere else. But we're human and it's very easy to put our eyes on others. It's very easy to put our eyes on our, on our church. But we're never told to do that. We are more than conquerors when our eyes are focused on the eyes and the heart of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Secondly, in our present day, because we have Jesus with us, we have a change in attitude. When we see life through the lens of God, our attitude becomes one of gratitude in all things because of what he has done. That's why Christians have a hope when they're in hopeless situations because they focus on God and that gives them a gratitude. Firstly, in the present time, our job is to have a change in focus, have a change in attitude. Secondly, have a change in our priorities. 
when we pursue a relationship with God and a relationship that God wants, we start to prioritise relationships in the family of God. Fourthly, we have, in the present day, with God on our side, we have a change in purpose. We naturally want to serve and build new relationships. We naturally want to serve and build new relationships. When God says through the prophet Jeremiah, better days are coming, we need to start to believe it. <coughs> we need to live it because it will change us. We start to align ourselves with the hope that we have in the soon coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A school in a large city had a program where children who were put in the hospital for some time were given um, schoolwork with mentors to help them to stay up to speed or to catch up while they were in hospital. One day, a teacher was assigned to a particular kid in a particular ward in a particular hospital. She took the boy's name and his room number from the front desk and um, met briefly with the class teacher. And um, the class teacher said to her, I'd like you to please catch him up on nouns and adverbs. And um, he doesn't understand them. Can you um, drill that to, into him so that he catches up and doesn't fall behind? The hospital program teacher went to see the boy that afternoon. And no one had mentioned to her that the boy had horrific burns. And she, the sight of the boy and these ghastly burns made her stammer as she talked to him. I've been asked by your school to help you with nouns and adverbs. The boy turned his face towards her and listened attentively as she spent an hour with him, lovingly teaching him about nouns and adverbs. When she left, she felt she hadn't accomplished anything. But the next day, the nurse asked her, what did you do to that boy? The teacher thought that she had done something wrong and so she started apologising. <coughs> and the nurse said, no, no, no. There's something amazing happening with this boy. I mean, we've been very worried about the little boy. He just wanted to curl up in the corner and just die and nothing we tried on him worked. But since yesterday... He's had a whole change in attitude and he's fighting back. He's responding to the treatment and taking his medication again now and it's as though he's decided all of a sudden to live again. Two weeks later, the boy explained to people <coughs> in an interview as on his way out of, of the uh, hospital that he had completely given up hope on, in life until this lovely teacher arrived. And he said, everything changed when I came to the simple realisation that they wouldn't send a teacher to work on me with nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? It gave him a hope in his heart and he lived. You and I have the hope in our hearts that heaven sent a person of the branch of David, <coughs> the righteous one, the righteous Lord, to turn our hearts around that we're looking at the wall of sin and wishing to die. They wouldn't send Jesus to a broken world with a boy who was dying, would they? Jesus comes to you and I 
with a mighty hope, the hope that he's building a family in heaven and he's coming back for us soon. John 14, 1 to 3. We know the passage so well. I go and repair a place for you. And if I go and repair a place for you, I will what? And receive you unto myself that where I am, no wonder it's called the blessed hope of the Adventist church. And many Adventists all through history have hung on to that hope because Jesus, the hope of his soon return, is the theme of all the Bible. As we live in this season of when the hope was given and when it's going to be realised, some of us wonder, will it ever happen? Because we're in the waiting seasons, waiting so long. We're now in the generations of Seventh-day Adventists. As we live in this season, I've got, I've got a, um, a few questions I want you to ponder and answer. In fact, I want to give you more questions and answers. So ponder this question of hope. Is your hope centred in the person of Jesus Christ or something else? Is your hope centred in the person of Jesus Christ or something else? It's a, it's a big matter. It's a huge matter. One brings freedom and the other brings slavery. Secondly, as you've grown as a Christian, has your hope expanded or diminished? As you've grown as a Christian, has your hope expanded or diminished? Thirdly, in our Christian walk, in our day-to-day -day life, in our personal life and our devotion to Jesus, what are you willing to risk because of what Jesus has done? Look at what Jesus has risked for you. What are you willing to risk because of what Jesus has done? Can you sing with me this morning? We have this hope. We have this hope.